Welcome to Implementing a Member Macro, Part 2 of our Macro Experiments. Last time we declared a member macro that we could use with a class or a struct. You might remember these were the files generated for us when we created a new package using the new Swift Macros template. Last time we looked at create async stream, which is where the macro was declared. We looked at main, which provided an example of using our macro. And we looked at a new assert that allowed us to test our macro. This time we're actually going to implement the macro in create async stream macro. As a reminder, this macro adds this public async stream of a given type and a private continuation to a class or a struct. Here's what the usage of the macro looks like. And now this is what gets added to the class. There's the public property numbers, which is an async stream of ints, which vends underscore numbers. And there's the private stored property, underscore numbers, numbers continuation, which is what we get back from async stream make stream of int.self. The key is that the user is able to specify the type, and it appears in the macro, and they declare a string, which shows up in the names of all of the members. The big idea of macros is a macro produces an AST from an AST. That's an abstract syntax tree. We're not going to worry so much about what's produced. For now, just worry about the source. In other words, when you look at create async stream of int.self named numbers, how do I pull that apart into an abstract syntax tree? There are actually two great tools for this. You'll find one at swift-ast-explorer.com. And if we paste our macro in, you'll see on the right side that we get the syntax tree. And if you look closely, you'll see, oh, there's the int and there's numbers. And we can see the path to each of them. For the second tool, let's start to implement the member macro and we'll use something that Apple included in one of the WWDC videos. So let's work with create async stream macro. And the only thing we have to do to conform to member macro is implement the expansion method. Expansion takes a node, which is the attribute syntax. It takes a declaration, that's some decal group syntax. In this case, it's our class example. It's the thing that we're decorating with our macro. And it either throws an error or it returns an array of decal syntaxes. That's the abstract syntax tree that it's returning. Just to make this compile for now, let's hard code the AST with exactly what we want if our string was numbers and our type was int. We'll replace this later. And before the return, we'll use the node in the declaration to take our incoming abstract syntax tree and decide what it is that we have to generate. And now we're ready for the second tool. Inside our expansion, let's set a breakpoint and let's run the unit test. And when we hit this line, we'll break and be able to type in PO node to explore the attribute syntax that we're being provided with. This is what we see, and this is fantastic. You can see little things like the at sign and the create async stream and the left parentheses and the right parentheses around all of the arguments. That's this stuff that I have highlighted. I really just care about the arguments inside for now. So let's remove the stuff that I don't need and let's simplify a bit to get a little shorter view and look at the argument. The argument is all of that piece. It is a tuple expression element list syntax. Now in my first attempt, I used foundation tools and scooped out the bits of the string that I wanted. I treated the whole thing like a string and just treated it that way. You lose all of the information that way and it's, it's just not a good way to go about things. Instead, we're gonna use the structure. We wanna get at that int, we wanna get at that numbers, and so we need to walk the trees to get there. In the next episode, I'll care about things like of and the colon, but for now, I don't care about the label. I just want to get to the int inside of the expression. Similarly, I just want the int. I don't care about the dot self. As for the second parameter, for now, I'm not going to worry about the label named in the colon and the quotation marks. So let's get rid of those. And now let's simplify further. We're beginning to get a better idea of what the structure is, how we can walk this tree how we can get to the int, how we can get to the numbers. As a first step, one way to do this would be to say, I've got my argument, let's look at its children and see what I can get from there. Now there's several ways to get this far, let's look at one of them. A first simple way is to wrap node.argument inside of syntax. Next time we'll choose a different technique to do it, but just follow me here for now. I can ask that syntax for its children, and each child I can check to see, is it a tuple express element syntax? If it is, keep it. If not, discard it. That's what compact math does. And so when I'm done, 
arguments is an array of these children. Well, let's check that we have two of them. If we don't have two of them, then something went wrong. If I have fewer than two of them, then either I input the wrong number, I wasn't parsing them correctly, and if I have more than two of them, I don't know what went on. For now, let's issue a fatal error if I don't have exactly two. Next time, we'll work with the specific error type that we create. Let's put all this inside a method that we can call. Because expansion was a static method, I'll make sure arguments is as well, and it either throws an error or it returns an array of tuple expression element syntax. So I've got the two children. Let's use the first to extract the type, to extract that int. So I start with attribute zero, the first child, and I get its expression, and I check to make sure it has the correct type, and then I reach inside it for its base. I'm just following the tree that we had before, and if something goes wrong, I issue a fatal error. Wrap that up in a method, and I should have gotten the type back, which is an expression syntax. That's the first child. To extract the name, we look at the second child, the child at index one, and we ask for its expression. We check that it's the correct type. In this case, it's a string literal. And if it's a string literal, we can ask for the represented literal value. And so name will be a string. And if anything failed, we issue another fatal error. Again, wrap that in a static method that we can call. And now we can put that all together in the macro expansion in the expansion method. Here's my expansion method. Remember, before we returned anything, we had to do some processing. Well, that's what we did in those little methods. Call self.arguments to get our array of tuple expression element syntax. Use the first one to extract the type and use the second one to extract the name. So now we have our type and our name. What are we going to return? Now, we were returning things that were hard coded in. Those are the things I have colored in orange here. I don't want to hard code anymore. I want to use the type and the name that I've been able to extract. So we've got our holes in our template that we're going to fill in. Once we have the type, we can fill in the raw type, and we can fill in raw type.self. In our example, that would give us our int inside of the generic and our int.self as the argument for make stream. Next, we use the value we extracted as name, and we use it to specify the name underscore name, and name continuation. And there's expansion. To my surprise, the package built, the test passes, and the macro expands perfectly. There are things that we can do to make it safer, things that we can do more idiomatically, and we'll do those next time.